Hare Krishna. I'm sorry for the delay and have kept you waiting for some time. Sorry, if I can just make a humble request, if you can please turn off your mobile phones. And children are welcome to stay and listen in the class, but if they're going to be a little bit restless, we humbly request them to please, um, you know, maybe play outside. Hare Krishna. Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Vardhari Jai Radha Madhava कुंज बिहारी गोपी जन वल्लभ गिरिवर धारी यशोदानंदन ब्रज जन रंजन Yashodanandana Brajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tiravana Chari Yamuna Tiravana Chari Jai Radha Madhava Kunj Bihari Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Vardhari Shri Shri Radha Gopinath ki jai, Shri Shri Gaurnitai ki jai, Shri Shri Jagannath Valadeva Subhatra Devi ki jai, Nitai Gaur Premanande. All glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories, all glories, all glories to Shri Guru and Gauranga. We go on till the darshan, right? That's at what time? Nine. Nine. Where's, where's the clock? It's actually behind Oh, it's behind there, okay. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yenatasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamahyam Dadati Svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yutapadakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padang Sahaganda Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitamscha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Preshtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swamin Nitinamini Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vansha Kalpatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanepyo Vaishnavepyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadikaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna 
I'm very happy to be back again in Radha Gopinath Temple here in Sydney. It's always a pleasure to be here with these wonderful deities and all of you very nice devotees. The topic we've chosen for today and the next two days is from Shraddha to Prema. It's a very important topic because it tells us the milestones that we will encounter on the path of progress towards perfection of our human form of life. To reach the perfection of our Krishna consciousness means to reach the stage of prema, pure love of Godhead, the ultimate goal of life. But the destination is not so easy to reach. It involves so much struggle, hard work, patience, endurance, not easy at all. We have milestones for any human endeavor. When we have a student going through school, there, are year, there is year one, year two, year three, it goes all the way up to university. In every sphere of activity, we see milestones. Even for a child growing up, there are milestones within the womb, outside, after birth, the weight, and so on and so forth. So when we are taking to Krishna consciousness, we would like to know what those milestones are and how we can understand whether we have progressed or not and whether we are progressing or not, what are the different stages involved. It's very rare, first of all, for someone to even come to this platform of Shraddha. Shraddha will come to what it means, basically little faith. Sydney has a very, very large population, but today in this room we have only very few people sitting here. The devotee community numbers also are very small compared to the general population of the world. Coming to Krishna consciousness is a very rare thing. And we should actually try to understand our good fortune for being here in this process and amongst devotees. So as we go along, we need to have a clear understanding of where we are and where we want to go and where we ultimately want to reach. Because you see, Bhakti, Krishna consciousness is also like a science. It's not something whimsical. Although there is a lot of subjectivity involved, there's a lot of inner exploration involved, but still, it's a science. There is a method to do things. <clears throat> and we should know what these methods are and what the different stages of our advancement are. So, let's talk about Krishna consciousness overall. Srila Rupa Goswami in the Nectar of Devotion, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, has broadly uh, classified three stages of devotion, Bhakti into three stages. The first is called sadhana bhakti. I'm sure you've all heard these terms. Some of you may be a little new here and coming for the first time or you've just very newly come. You may or may not be familiar with these terms, but these are standard terminology for all of us as devotees. And we should be very well acquainted with what these terms mean. First is sadhana bhakti. Sadhana means the means. It means the means. The process, the way, the instruments required to attain something, the method to attain something. So there is a process of sadhana bhakti in which we are in the stage of practice. We have not become perfect. So we are merely practicing to become devotees. You see, becoming a devotee is a very difficult thing. 
A genuine devotee is one who has reached very, very high stages. So we are struggling now with the three modes of material nature and we are trying to go beyond to come to the higher stages of bhakti. But till a very high stage of bhakti is still the stage of practice. Practice makes perfect. So by continuously practicing all through our life, then we will be able to attain perfection. So there are two types of bhakti, sadhana bhakti and sadhya bhakti. Sadhya means the goal, that which is perfect. It comes from the word siddha, which means perfection or perfect. And sadhya bhakti means that which is perfect. So sadhya bhakti is prema bhakti. When we reach the stage of ultimate love of Godhead, and now we are in the stage of sadhana bhakti. And in between there is a stage called bhava bhakti, which is just the budding stage of prema bhakti. When we achieve a very, very exalted stage, and we are almost perfect, but not quite. And at the same time, it can't be said that we are in the stage of practicing devotees. We have gone beyond the stage of practice, but we have not quite attain the stage of perfection. So therefore the third category of bhava bhakti and especially these two terms bhava bhakti and prema bhakti we are going to deal with in the next two days because that is part of the nine stages that we are going to speak about. So sadhana bhakti the stage of practicing bhakti under certain rules and regulations is called vaidhi bhakti. The word vaidhi comes from vidhi. Vidhi means rules. So initially when we start something, we have to follow rules. Then it becomes natural or spontaneous. Let's take the example of uh, learning how to type. Initially, you are a one-finger typist. You, you press one button at a time and then you're looking for the keyboard, you're looking for the different alphabets on the keyboard and you go very slow. Then you learn that there is a process, there is a technique that you can learn. So then you learn how to place the fingers and how to move the fingers and how they should move and then you start doing it. You're still practicing. Now you make many mistakes when you try to type very fast. But nevertheless, with more practice, then you get uh, better and better. Finally, a stage comes when your fingers fly on the keyboard and you don't even have to look at the keyboard. And you type correctly and very fast. So you've kind of reached the stage of perfection. How did that come? First of all, there was training. There was education. Somebody had to teach us. Of course, you can also do it on your own, but there is a technique. And you have to know, so someone has to tell you, look, place your fingers like this and do it like that. So you learned something and then you practiced it. Not for one day or two days, but for a long time. And by practicing it continuously, frequently, then you attain the stage where you could naturally type, even without looking. So similarly, in the beginning, we followed the, the teachings, we followed the rules and regulations very strictly because we haven't got that natural, spontaneous taste for bhakti. So to some degree, we have to force ourselves to do it. We have got some taste, but not that much. And therefore, we are very easily tempted and distracted by the events and people. Can we close the door, please? You can come in, close the door. <laughs> so when we come in uh, to the path of bhakti and we do vaidhi bhakti, then our taste grows, but then we are subject to so many problems and we'll be dealing with that as we go along, maybe tomorrow. Uh, we get distracted and we get uh, upset about something and uh, we get stressed about something and we may give up some of our practices or the enthusiasm for doing those practices may wane and then after some time when some devotees come and perk us up again then we say okay we are back again and we go along for some time 
And again, we, we slow down because of some events that may have happened. Somebody didn't speak properly to us in the temple, or maybe something happened at home, or something happened with health, and we began to, our faith in, in Krishna began to shake. So we start wavering. We are not so strong. So therefore, one regularly hears and learns and follows a discipline and even though one doesn't feel like doing something, one does it because with intelligence one understands it's necessary for me to do it for my welfare. Just like a person who is being treated by a doctor is told to follow a certain regimen and a lifestyle. The patient usually is very impatient and doesn't want to follow any regimen and wants to get all right very quickly, but doesn't get all right. So then the patient may get frustrated and say, this doctor is no good. Or this med these medicines are no good. Let me try something else. Or perhaps a patient gives up the medicines altogether. Or doesn't have the willpower to follow the rules that the doctor gives. Don't eat this, don't do that. Just succumbs every time. And then again, when the, he or she falls sick, then they remember, oh, I have to follow the do's. The doctors had told me this. So even though the patient doesn't like some of the rules and regulations, the patient follows them because there is that much understanding that this is good for me. So there is obedience to the doctor. So similarly, in the stage of Vaidhi Bhakti, one follows the vidhi or the rules because there is an intellectual conviction that grows with time. Initially it's not so strong, but then it grows. There is that initial conviction that this is good for me. I must surrender to the instructions of the scriptures. I must surrender to a bona fide spiritual master. And even though sometimes I don't like these instructions, I must do it because it is for my spiritual good. And there is a taste as well, as I said, it grows. There is something there. Because if there wasn't some taste, there wasn't some inclination for it, we wouldn't have agreed to follow these rules in the first place. So there is that taste. And by following the rules and regulations, our taste grows and grows and grows. So this is the stage of Vaidhi Bhakti. A stage comes when one's following of the devotional practices is not dependent upon uh, obedience to the rules, on artificial obedience to the rules, on forced obedience to the rules. At that time, it becomes just natural. It becomes spontaneous. And one does it because it just becomes so normal and natural for us. You know, long time... Uh, takers of medicines, let's say for sugar or BP or whatever it is, initially they keep forgetting to take the medicines and but by the time it becomes part of your life, then you just keep taking, it's normal, it's, it's like your food or your everything it becomes so normal that you don't forget it because it's just there it becomes part of your life something very natural so similarly as you follow the rules and regulations and the process starts acting in your heart, in your consciousness, then it becomes very normal. It becomes natural. It becomes spontaneous. Now no one has to tell you. See, the scriptures are saying you have to do this. The spiritual master is saying you have to do this. It's good for you if you, have, if you do this. It's bad for you if you don't do that. No one has to say that. Because now one has developed natural taste for it. That stage is called Raganuga Bhakti. But mind you, it's still the stage of practice because we still haven't become perfect. One's process, one's mind has got attracted. One is seeing it's tasty, it's delicious, I like it, it's really nice. Oh, I like this chanting, I like the kirtan, I like the deity worship. We look forward to it. There is great eagerness to do it. There is enthusiasm that is natural. One takes initiative oneself almost helplessly. 
by instinct almost. So then one continues because now one has taste and the, the rate of progress is now more rapid. One keeps progressing more and more. And as we go on, the barometer, the parameter of success or of uh, progress is that one becomes more and more attracted to Krishna and everything connected to Krishna. One develops more and more love for Krishna and one becomes more and more detached from anything not connected with Krishna. And one doesn't have to be told, you know, this is not good for your Krishna conscious. Stop going to the pub or don't do this or stop seeing the movies, you know, the, on the, in, the, in the internet or whatever it is. One just doesn't feel like doing it. One just comes to the point when one may almost feel disgusted. Oh, I don't want to do all these things. I just want to do Krishna consciousness. It comes from within spontaneously but behind that spontaneous bhakti there is a lot that has happened one has worked very hard one has voluntarily accepted a very rigid and strict discipline it's only after that that it becomes spontaneous even look at athletes and sportsmen how hard they have to work what kind of a discipline they have to have in their life. They have to rise really early in the morning, go for their exercises and their, you know, their coach will put them through a real rough grind. They, they can't have a normal social life, they would like to do things and, but no, they can't stay up late, they have to go to bed on time. Their diet is severely restricted and they follow all that happily. Sometimes maybe there's some Resentment, but overall they, they know I want to achieve this goal of getting that Olympic gold medal so I will do it at any cost so because they are so determined to obtain that goal they are willing to take some inconvenience that is called austerity tapasya in Sanskrit so following rules and regulations is always like that nobody likes rules and regulations in life the nature of the conditioned living entity is that we just want to do what we want to do. We want to do whatever the mind says at any given time. If the mind says do it, we want to do that. That's how basically children are. Because children cannot perform austerity. Children, because they are controlled by their mind, they will just do whatever the mind says. They don't see, they don't, they don't have that intellectual capacity to see, this is not the place to do this. This is not the time to do that. The mind is very powerful. So they will just do it. But when there is determination, when one has a little faith, then one follows the rules and regulations. So there is some faith, there is some taste, and it goes on increasing. And then when it becomes spontaneous, then one has reached <clears throat> that stage <clears throat> which we can call ecstatic love of Godhead, which is Bhava Bhakti. That Bhakti is now not just spontaneous, but it is imbued with a kind of ecstasy that was lacking before. There is a kind of very deep bliss and it is sometime, it sometimes manifests in certain symptoms which are not seen in those who don't have them. They can't be imitated, although some people do try to imitate them. We have so many stories in the scriptures of how people try to imitate the symptoms of one in the stage of Bhava Bhakti. There are tears that flow from the eyes incessantly, the hair stand on end, and there are many such symptoms. And we'll talk about those when we reach uh, the topic, maybe tomorrow or day after. So one comes to Bhava Bhakti, and then we are just a whisker away from that final stage of Prema Bhakti. When we are in the stage of Bhava Bhakti, there is still that very slim possibility in Bhava Bhakti is very slim but it's still there that we may get distracted from the path. 
in, in the earlier stages, the possibility is very strong, especially if you're living in Sydney <laughs> or in any place for that matter, actually. Anywhere in the modern world, in the modern day and age, because the distractions are so heavy. The, the, the ideology of the world uh, is so strong. The winds of worldly life are so powerful, like a typhoon, like a tornado. They just blow away the discriminatory intelligence of practicing devotees. And they get bewildered. So however, as you go up to Raganuga, the possibility of that drastically drops. Because there's so much taste now we have for serving Krishna, there's hardly any taste left for anything else. And then we go further up, and when you reach Bhava, that taste has deepened even further. So strongly that when, when one is experiencing ecstasy of Krishna consciousness, then when one doesn't want anything to do with material life, but still, everything has not got completely purified yet. There's some little fractional residue of some contamination remaining. But as one continues, one reaches a stage of prema bhakti. And then there is no more possibility of coming back. One has attained the stage of perfection. And that is the stage where one will not need to be reborn in this material world again. One will attain the spiritual world after one dies, after one leaves this body. So that is the perfection of life. This is what we should strive to be at, to strive to attain the stage of Prema Bhakti. Okay, can we have the next please? Srila Rupa Goswami, our great Acharya, has written many wonderful books on the topic of Krishna consciousness. And he has studied the various scriptures and with his very pure intelligence and his pure devotion for Krishna, he has managed to uh, give us or he has given us uh, a good analysis of the milestones of bhakti, of the different stages involved from the very beginning to the stage of perfection. We saw it in three stages. Now the first stage, Srila Rupa Goswami have subdivided into seven stages. Because the first stage of sadhana bhakti is very long, very arduous. Whereas once you are in bhava, then you just get into prema very quickly. Hmm? You got your momentum. But till you reach bhava, and especially till you reach nishtha, stage number five, that's a long journey. You know, the longest thing in a given life is the fourth stage. That's the tough one. And we're going to spend quite a bit of tomorrow looking at that. So let's start with the first one. The first stage is called shraddha. That's faith. The second stage is Sadhu Sangha, which means the association with devotees. And it moves progressively. When you have Shraddha, you move to the association of devotees. And when you come to the association of devotees, Sadhu Sangha, then the devotees make you do devotional service. They make you chant, they make you hear, and so on. So that's called Bhajana Kriya. Kriya means work or activity, and bhajana means of worship, of bhakti. Then as you keep doing that, you keep rendering devotional service, then the unwanted things in the heart, the greed, the anger, the envy, the pride, the lust, illusion, everything starts getting destroyed. The bhakti is now becoming stronger and stronger, as we regularly practice, then all these unwanted things which cause us so much disturbance in our life, they start diminishing step by step by step. And eventually, not when we have completely finished with the stage four, 
but even when there is substantial reduction of the unwanted things in the heart even though there is some uh, remaining one can be said to have uh, attained the stage of uh, nishtha which is steadiness in anartha nivritti there is still a lot of back and forth there's a lot of fickle mindedness still coming and going and and uh, uh, maybe being enthusiastic and not enthusiastic and back and forth but in nishtha one becomes more determined so the characteristic of nishtha is a stage of determination where one becomes rock solid in the performance of one's spiritual activities and even though theoretically one can get dislodged from that stage but it generally would not happen and with continued devotional service one gets more taste which is called ruchi taste in krishna consciousness and you want more and more you are not satiated now and then you reach the platform of asakti now you have got deep attachment to krishna and to krishna consciousness in all his facets and now you are ready to move to the stage of bhava of ecstatic love of godhead where one is now qualified to see krishna face to face and then as i said it's only a short hop step and jump to prema bhakti so this is the seek the sequence now we need to note that uh, each stage is included in the next stage yes shraddha means faith so the faith initially is weak but as we come to sadhu sangha then in the association of devotees that faith becomes stronger then we perform devotional service and as we perform more and more we associate more with devotees and we develop stronger faith so as we move on then anartha nivritti the stage of decreasing unwanted attachments then our faith increases our sadhu sangha increases our devotional service increases so each stage is included in the later stages and finally in the stage of prema the ninth stage it includes everything that we have in the first eight stages by everything i mean positive things not the negative things and more that is not to be found in the earlier stages so these are the nine steps please remember that and also please remember that the first seven pertain to devotional service in the stage of practice so you can see that the last stage of sadhana bhakti is asakti or attachment which is actually a very elevated stage of love of godhead compared to where we are ordinarily in our devotional service and that's still considered the stage of practice can we have the next slide please <clears throat> so in the chaitanya charitamrita chaitanya mahaprabhu has given us the verse which gives us this sequence aado shraddha tatah sadhu sangotha bhajana kriya tato narth nivritti syat tato nishtha ruchi statah अथा सक्तिस्तो भाव तत प्रेमाभ्युदी साधका प्रेमण प्रादुर्भाव भवे क्रम सो लेट्स सी हाउ चैतन्य महाप्रभु एक्सप्लेन्स दिस इन द बिगिनिंग दे मस्ट बी फेथ देन वन बिकम्स इंटरेस्टेड इन एसोसिएटिंग विथ प्योर डिवोटीज देर आफ्टर वन इज इनिशिएटेड बाय द स्पिरिचुअल मास्टर and executes the regulative principles under his orders thus one is freed from all unwanted habits and becomes firmly fixed in devotional service thereafter one develops taste and attachment this is the way of sadhana bhakti the execution of devotional service according to the regulative principles gradually emotions intensify and finally there is an awakening of love 
This is the gradual development of love of Godhead for the devotee interested in Krishna consciousness. So there we are. Where we are and where we want to be, the whole route has been charted out for us here. It's like your um, GPS, the whole map's been charted out. Yes? And you have the lady who says, after 100 meters, turn left, do right, go right. So here also, instead of the GPS, we have the GSS. You know what the GSS is? Guru Sadhu Shastra. So just as we have the GPS to guide us from one destination to another destination, when we're driving, so when you're moving in the journey towards pure love of Godhead, you also need a GPS and that's the Guru and the Sadhu means the previous Gurus and also the other Sadhus contemporarily and third the Shastra which means the scripture which gives us the instructions and the guidance of what we should do and what we shouldn't so this is our uh, GSS and we move ahead. So let's start talking about the first stage of Shraddha. Shraddha. The word Shraddha, what does it mean? In Sanskrit it means faith. But you see, faith can be very preliminary faith or faith can be very, very strong faith. But it's faith. So to start with, Shraddha or a little faith represents the preliminary desire for self-realization because without that if you don't have that desire why would you uh, do anything connected to spiritual life so there is that desire something there in the heart that prompts you to to do something about your spiritual urge you have that urge within you you want to know something hmm? So that little interest, that little desire, that little faith that exists is called Shraddha in the beginning stages. And that Shraddha becomes deeper and deeper as we continue. But to start with, because it is tender, so we are saying it's a preliminary desire for self-realization. It is a first step of one aspiring to be a devotee. Shraddha also can be understood in terms of being a tendency to serve Krishna. You know, because we may not even know who is Krishna, what is Krishna. In the beginning when we, we are not aware of these things. Uh, we don't have knowledge, we don't know what is scripture, we may not even know who is Krishna. Or even if you have heard of Krishna, we may have some kind of confused notion about Krishna. Not a very clear idea. But there is some seed, some seed of an intention or a desire to want to serve. It may be manifest or it may be hidden somewhere deep in the heart in such a way that even we may not be recognizing it. It's there coming from somewhere. From where? We'll talk about it in a few moments. So this tendency that exists in us is called Shraddha in the preliminary stages. And as it goes on, then that tendency to serve becomes more strong and we want to serve. We really want to serve more. And then we become addicted to service to Krishna. We don't want to do without serving Krishna. Shraddha can be also understood to be faith in revealed scriptures that deal with bhakti. Now there are many types of scriptures even in the house of the Vedas. But amongst the Vedic scriptures, there are many that deal with materialistically oriented religion, which is called Karma Kanda, where you perform some religious rituals or activities to get some material benefit. Or there's another kind of a category of scripture in the Vedas where you follow some austerities and so on to attain the impersonal spiritual light where our understanding is limited to that that's called the Jnana Kanda 
But the genuine devotee of Krishna doesn't want to have anything to do with either that materialistically inspired religion, which is what most of the world does, most of the religious world does, because their religion or their spirituality is materially motivated. But that is not what Krishna Consciousness is all about. Krishna Consciousness has to be free from material motivations and even free from the false notion of merging into that impersonal spiritual light and extinguishing one's individuality. One rises even beyond that conception. So there are other scriptures which are the bhakti scriptures which clearly enunciate what the nature of the Absolute Truth is. That the Absolute Truth is ultimately the Supreme Person. He is a spiritual personality. He is love and mercy personified. And we have to develop love for Him. And that is our constitutional position. So it is something very natural that is being invoked from within. It is not an artificial imposition on our consciousness. It's not something we are forcing the soul to do. It is the very nature of the soul to love Krishna. So, these scriptures, the Vedic scriptures that deal with Krishna consciousness are the ones that the devotee wants to have faith in and knowledge of. So devotees are not concerned much about the other types of scriptures. So the Shraddha is that. Because Shraddha, from Shraddha comes obedience, you see. So for obedience you have to have some faith, you know. If you go to a doctor, you must have some faith in the doctor before you start taking his or her medicines. So therefore, if you are going to do Krishna consciousness, then you need to have that faith in the scripture which gives you the instructions. And when faith comes, then there is that restlessness. Restlessness to want to find some answers to your questions. You start looking up some books. You start, uh, you know, going here and there to this spiritual movement, that spiritual movement. You start looking out for somebody who can maybe help you on this path. You're looking, you're looking, you're looking. It may take years. Or it may be all of a sudden. We don't know. How does that faith come? That's a, that's, a, that's a different question. We'll come to it in a few moments. But eventually when we come to the point, then we have to develop faith in the scriptures. Then we will follow those instructions very sincerely. Can we have the next one? Now, <clears throat> Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, one of our Acharyas, has explained that in this world there are two kinds of faith, Shraddha. One is mundane faith, ordinary faith of this world. Most people have this kind of faith. This faith is very weak, it's very fickle, because it has to do with faith in the people of this world faith in the events, in the things and the uh, phenomena of this world. So we see in this day and age especially, there's a crisis of faith. No one has faith in anyone in this day and age, yes? Hardly. So worldly faith is faith that causes pain because you get disillusioned eventually. You place your faith in something or in someone and then there's some problem. So worldly faith is, is fickle, doesn't last for long, and it's the cause of pain. It doesn't help us in any spiritual way. As opposed to that kind of shraddha or faith, there is what we can call transcendental faith, spiritual faith. Spiritual faith, again, is of two categories, two types. One is regulative faith, which means faith that is born out of uh, acceptance of uh, injunctions from the scripture. 
So this scripture says, if I want to progress in devotional service, then I must follow this rule, I must do this, I must chant like this, I must, I must worship the deity like this, I must hear the lectures like this. Yes, I must do that. So there is that faith in the instructions, faith in the scripture. So there is a kind of an imposition there. But in spontaneous faith, it's not like that. Whether you know the scriptural injunctions or not, you should, but even if you don't, in some cases, rare cases, there is such a natural attraction and a natural faith that comes up. All of a sudden, sometimes even, we don't, may not even know why. You just become a devotee of Krishna like this. And that attraction is spontaneous and it usually comes about when somebody associates with devotees and hears from them about the pastimes of Krishna, especially in Vrindavan. <clears throat> so this is a spontaneous faith then one is not bothered about what the scriptures say or not. One just likes it so much. One develops that faith spontaneously. Can we have the next one? As I mentioned earlier, faith can be komala or weak or dridh and strong. And as one continues doing Krishna consciousness, then the faith moves from being weak to becoming very strong. The next one, please. So how does Shraddha arise? How does it come? The scriptures say something very cryptic by good fortune. Now this is a very loaded word. What does it mean by good fortune? We are very fortunate to, to have this faith. What is the meaning of that? And we'll come to that in a few verses that we'll take up from the Chaitanya Charita Amrita. But suffice it to say that faith, that good fortune means that you were fortunate earlier also. And how were you fortunate earlier? Because you got some glimpse of Krishna consciousness. You got some connection with Krishna consciousness in your previous lives. And because of connection in those previous lives, innately within you there was that tendency that made you more inclined towards spiritual life. It became more natural for you. And you developed a, an automatic inclination to go to the association of devotees. You started coming even though perhaps nobody invited you even, but you just come. You start associating with devotees, you hear and you develop more taste. So, in the association of devotees, faith begets faith. Now, this Shraddha is transcendental, spiritual, as I've mentioned earlier. Nothing spiritual can come from anything material. Only spiritual things can give rise to some other spiritual things. And because this faith is spiritual, only something or someone spiritual can give it to us. We can get spiritual faith only from someone who has spiritual faith. Otherwise, there is no other way of getting spiritual faith. It's a very important point for all of us. The only way to get spiritual faith is to associate with those who have spiritual faith and then it will rub off on us. And the stronger the faith of the person we are associating with, the more that will rub off on us and the more we will also become stronger in our faith. Actually, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur in the Sri Chaitanya Shikshak, Shikshamrita mentions that it's mysterious about why somebody develops faith. And he says some people develop faith all of a sudden for no apparent cause or reason. 
Some people develop faith after having scrutinized certain scriptures in an impartial way and intellectually they come to some conclusion and they develop some faith. Some people develop faith because of associating with devotees and hearing from them. Some people develop faith because of doing their Varnashrama Dharma duties properly. Some may develop faith without meeting devotees. Somehow there is a strong urge that has been there from the previous life. They've been searching and searching and somehow they come across some book or something and they take it up and they practice Krishna consciousness. So it's a very mysterious, mystical phenomenon of how somebody gets faith, spiritual faith. It's a very rare jewel of a gift to receive. This is the greatest gift you can give to somebody. You can give them spiritual faith, then you have done the greatest good you could ever have done to anybody in life. And when we have the spiritual faith, whatever be the degree of it, we should cherish it, we should hold on to it as our most precious possession, more precious than our wealth, our house, our car, and anything material that we may have, including this material body. Because this material body will eventually perish, but the transcendental faith will not perish. And that is what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. Neha bhi kramana shosti pratyavayo na vidyate svalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat. He says that even a little bit of devotional service that is performed in this life, even a little bit of transcendental faith that is acquired in this life will never be destroyed. It will continue on and protect us from the most dangerous types of fear which could be to slip down into lower species of life where we can fall into forgetfulness of Krishna. But we are protected. That faith carries forward to the next life. And if we don't complete it, and to the next, and the next, and the next, it accumulates and accumulates and accumulates over many lifetimes. So it is a journey of many lifetimes that we have taken. What is the time now? Sorry? 8.37? Okay. So what we have a little time to go through the verses from the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Now for those of you who may not follow the Sanskrit or the Bengali, doesn't matter. Uh, we can just see the translation and we'll understand. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is explaining to Sanatan Goswami how certain spiritual entities, the souls, come to Krishna consciousness. It's a very mystical phenomenon that happens, very bewildering. Sansara Brahmite ko no bhagya ke ho tare nadira pravahe jano kashta lage tire. The conditioned souls are wandering throughout the different planets of the universe, entering various species of life. By good fortune, one of those these souls may somehow or other be delivered from the ocean of nescience, just as one of the many big logs in a flowing river may by chance reach the bank. Kono bhagye, bhagye means fortune. So we are still grappling with this word fortune, by good fortune. So just as a log of wood flowing in a river by chance will uh, come, come to the banks. So similarly, uh, millions and millions and millions of spirit souls are wandering through the 8.4 million species of life in the universe, sometimes in one species, sometimes in another, sometimes in one body, on one planet, sometimes in another. And this has been going on from time immemorial, for millions and trillions of lives perhaps. And by some good fortune, 
one of those souls will come in contact with the association of devotees or rather will be ready for being delivered. The next one. Maivam mamadhamasyapi syad evachyuta darshanam riyamanah kala nadya kvachit tarati kaschana because I am so fallen, I shall never get a chance to see the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This was my false apprehension. Rather by chance, a person as fallen as I am may get to see the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Although one is being carried away by the waves of the river of time, one may eventually reach the shore. This is a a verse spoken by Akrura, the uncle of Krishna, who uh, at Kamsa's behest took Krishna and Balaram away from Vrindavan to Mathura. Of course, Akrura is a great devotee of the Lord. So what is he praying here? He is praying that I ne never imagined that I would have been fortunate enough to get the personal audience of the Supreme Lord Krishna. But I was wrong. By some good fortune, even a fallen person like me, of course Akrura is not fallen, but in his humility he is thinking like that. Even a fallen person like me may get to see the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Although one is being carried away by the waves of the river of time, one may eventually reach the shore. So this phrase, the river of time, is a picturesque way of depicting our predicament in this world. We have been flowing in the river of time. And after millions and millions of years, fortunately one day, one soul, one of us will get connected to some spiritual path. The next one, please. Konu bhagye karo samsara kshayon mukha hai Sadhu sange tabe krishne rati upajai Again, good fortune. By good fortune, one becomes eligible to cross the ocean of nescience. And when one's term of material existence decreases, one may get an opportunity to associate with pure devotees. By such associations, one's attraction to Krishna is awakened. So in the process of moving through so many lifetimes, one fortunate soul may get an opportunity to associate with devotees of the Lord, especially pure devotees. And then automatically one can understand that the term of that person's material existence will diminish very rapidly now. So why has that good fortune come about? As I mentioned earlier, because of many, many lifetimes of accumulation of that, of that spiritual faith, that transcendental faith has accumulated, grown, 1%, 3%, 5%, 8%, 10%. It has grown and grown and grown. And the cumulative faith over many lifetimes has now come to a point where we become eligible to come into the association of devotees. So the fact that all of us are sitting here in this room means that we've been through this. We've been through this process of accumulating this transcendental faith over many lives. And that fortune has brought us here. Face to face with Krishna in the form of his deity and his devotees. The next one, please. Bhava Pavargo Brahmato Yada Bhavaj Janasya Tarya Chyuta Sat Samagamaha Sat Sangamo Yarhita Daiva Sadgato Paravareshe Tvaijayate Ratihi O my Lord, O infallible Supreme Person, 
when a person wandering throughout the universes becomes eligible for liberation from material existence, he gets an opportunity to associate with devotees. When he associates with devotees, his attraction for you is awakened. You are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the highest goal of the topmost devotees and the Lord of the universe. So after wandering through so many planets and species throughout the universe and having accumulated that transcendental faith incrementally, bit by bit, bit by bit, bit by bit, over these lifetimes, then our good fortune now brings us to the association of devotees here. And that is the game changer in our life. Hmm? In the previous lives, we may have associated also, but only in a very casual way. And, but nevertheless, because we had some associations, so we got some benefit there. Somebody gave us a little prasadam. We heard the chanting of Krishna's names somewhere, somehow. Maybe we appreciated the devotees in some way. Oh, the devotees are really nice people. That's enough. That gets you going. That starts your movement towards the shore, towards the bank of the river of time. And with every such incremental activity of devotional service unknowingly performed or knowingly performed, that capital accumulates and accumulates and accumulates. And then you come into the association of devotees. Just like when you want to go on a vacation or something, you don't have enough money. So you're working and working and working, accumulating. Every month your balance increases. And then you say, okay, now I have this much, now I can go for my vacation. So over many lives we have that accumulation of, of spiritual faith capital. It grows, 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 grows. And then when we are ready, Krishna working through the laws of material nature and working as a Lord in the heart, He arranges our meeting with the devotees. So our meeting with the devotees is not some chance occurrence. It is not something that randomly happens. It is happening by divine arrangement. Nothing in this world happens by chance. No two people in this world meet or disperse by chance. It's all happening because of some mechanism that is working there. The subtle laws of nature, material as well as spiritual, that act. And in this way, these fortunate souls come to the association of devotee. And this game-changing occurrence has happened to all of us in this life. Because we are here today. That is the proof. And now we have to make sure that the game really changes and that we really score the goal and we really end up having a very good game so that we perfect our life and we take to this process very seriously. Is there any other slide after this? One more? Okay. And when we come, what happens? Krishna yadi kripa kare kono bhagya vane Guru antar yami rupe shikaya apane Krishna is situated in everyone's heart as the Chaitya Guru, the spiritual master within. When he is kind to some fortunate conditioned soul, he personally gives him lessons so he can progress in devotional service, instructing the person as a super soul within and the spiritual master without. So Krishna judges our readiness. He judges whether we are now eligible to come in the contact of devotees. And then he arranges it. And from inside, within, he guides us. Go to the temple. Go here. Go there. Go there. Come on. No, no, no. I don't want to go there. Go, 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 go. Go for it. Go. And that's why we are here today. And some time ago, we must have grappled with this the first time or the first few times. 
The push said, go, go. And inside the mind says something else. But the go, who was that go? Who was saying that? That's the super soul in the heart. Krishna very kindly from within is sending us, go, go to the association of devotees. We mustn't confuse the workings of the mind with the voice of the super soul. We have to be very cautious. It's not that anything that comes to a mind is the super soul speaking, no. We have to cross check. <laughs> then we may say, well, uh, the, the super soul told me go to the pub. No, 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 no. The super soul is not saying that. He will never say that. And that's my mind saying it. So we have to be very careful to distinguish and that will come by the GSS. So our map will say, you know, just like you're driving a car and you have four, three other people in the car and someone, go left, go right. You say, no, no, the GPS says we have to go like this. So you go like that. Yes. So the mind may say anything, but what does GSS say? We have to do that. And this way, finally, we come to that most hallowed destination, which is the association of devotees. We have finally arrived. But this is just the beginning. We have arrived and now we have to work hard to make it and we live in the association of devotees. So that's called Sadhu Sangha, the second stage. So we've talked only about the first stage today. And the second stage is Sadhu Sangha. Sadhu means the devotees. Sangha means association. The word Sangha we are all familiar with, which means company or association, but it has a connotation that is important for us to understand. The word Sangha means Samyak Rupena Gamana to wholeheartedly or completely go behind or follow. So the process of completely surrendering to the spiritual master and the devotees, the pure devotees, and following their instructions, following their footsteps, is what Sadhu Sangha is all about. Sadhu Sangha is not just a casual phenomenon. It's not some casual interaction with devotees, although that also helps. But real Sadhu Sangha means that we are serious aspirants for spiritual perfection. And we come to the path, we come to this association of devotees with the intention of samyak rupena gamana, of completely surrendering ourselves, body, mind and words, to the spiritual process, to submit ourselves to the process. Submitting ourselves to the process means submitting ourselves to people which is a difficult thing, especially in the modern day and age, where we don't like to submit to people. But as we understand the philosophy, we begin to see the merit in this. And we give up our ego, which prevents us from doing that. And then we come to Sadhu Sangha, this sublime association of devotees, where we learn about Krishna, we learn about Krishna consciousness and then our life moves ahead. The devotees, the sadhus, who are they? Who are the devotees of Krishna? Not anyone who claims to be a devotee of Krishna is actually a devotee of Krishna. We must exhibit the symptoms of a devotee of Krishna. We must follow the practices that a devotee is supposed to do. The, the word devotee is not some kind of an official or formal title that somebody can take. A person is known as a devotee when the person's heart is like that of a devotee. When the person's qualities and thoughts, words and deeds are like that of a devotee. So the scriptures are replete with descriptions of the glories of pure devotees. Even though we may not be pure devotees, 
but at least we are seriously aspiring to become like that. So we follow in the footsteps of these great devotees and we try to cultivate those qualities that these exalted devotees have. We cannot <clears throat> rationalize or justify our weaknesses or let's say something, some wrong behavior on the excuse or the pretext that, well, I'm not a pure devotee. No, a sincere devotee will always uh, aspire and will struggle to follow that standard sincerely. So this is called Sadhu Sangha. It is in this Sadhu Sangha that all good fortune will now blossom. Because of some good fortune, we have come here and now the fortune like a flower will blossom. And everything auspicious will happen in our life once we come to the association of devotees. We'll continue this tomorrow. We'll talk a little more about Sadhu Sangha and then we'll discuss that when you come into Sadhu Sangha, you have to be doing spiritual activities. It can't be that you come to the association of devotees and then do something unspiritual. Then that is not Sadhu Sangha. So Sadhu Sangha is not merely physically associating with devotees, but it is a question of doing what devotees are supposed to do together, not anything else. So what it is that devotees are supposed to be doing together, we will see tomorrow, because devotees, the first thing they do is to engage us in some devotional service. They make us chant Krishna's name or hear some messages about Krishna or take some prasadam. So after Shraddha and Sadhu Sangha, we come to the point of Bhajana Kriya, which we will discuss tomorrow. So we we'll leave the floor open for some questions. Do any of you have any questions? Yes. How much time do we have left, by the way? 8.56. Okay. So we have precisely four minutes for a question. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Nothing happens by chance in the world. But we've also read uh, in Prabhupada's books about this cosmic mercy. And we've read people, we've read devotees, I mean, we've heard devotees saying that Prabhupada gave cosmic mercy to someone. That's how they became a devotee, even though they were not qualified. Okay, so your question is that we see that transcendental faith accumulates over many lifetimes and then eventually brings us to the association of devotees. But we've also heard of this term, causeless mercy. Causeless mercy is mercy without a cause, as the term indicates. So how does one explain that in the light of this explanation? Causeless mercy can happen sometimes, but true causeless mercy is very rare. That is called a Kripa Siddha, where the person doesn't do anything and because Krishna wills, he just, who can stop Krishna if he wants to do something? Krishna gives his mercy for some reason he may have himself and that's it, but that is extremely rare. Generally what happens is there has to be some background. So when we use the word causeless mercy, we indicate that we get mercy that is disproportionately large in relation to our qualification or eligibility for it. There is something, some qualification, but it's very small. What we get in return is enormous. I give this example many times of... Um, a student in a school uh, who's appeared for an exam and the pass mark is 50 out of 100. Now, if the student gets about 45 marks, let's say, and it's very important for the student to pass, otherwise he or she misses the year, has to repeat the year. So the teacher may, may feel a little merciful and say, okay, let me just give five grace marks to this student. And pass the student, so then he moves on to the next year. So that's called mercy. Yes, causeless mercy, 
because you you deserved you did you did something you did something but there was a little gap so that was filled up but if there's another student who gets only 3 marks out of 100 the teacher will very unlikely give 47 marks grace <laughs> to make that student pass yes because it's very little so similarly, even when we talk of causeless mercy in general, we should see that we must have done something. Hmm? Again this, Hare Krishna. So we'll talk, now there is causeless mercy here, in front of us. So let us relish it and take shelter of the holy names as we take darshan of their beautiful forms. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.